A leader is best when people barely know he exists. When his work is done, his aim fulfilled. They will then say, we did it ourselves. Hi my friends, welcome to another episode of Makamba Life. My guest today is a distinguished, or should I say the distinguished, political economist, analyst, author, and the Deputy Chairman of South African Institute of International Affairs. Welcome, Moile Simbek. Great to be here. You don't have a middleman name, do you? I do have one, but uh, <laughs> I don't want to spend energy on that. <laughs> like mine is very long. Chafunga <laughs> Moyo. And uh, here we go. So, since you believe in going straight into business, may I know, and I'm sure a lot of people wonder, what effect did it have on you? you know, growing up in a home with parents that were highly educated at that time. There were very few that were not only educated, but also at a, a tertiary level, but um, also being politically active. Well, I always assumed that uh, that's how families operated, that they were politically active, that they were educated, we were also shopkeepers, by the way, which is something that gets oh, wow. overlooked. Okay. Uh, we owned a general dealership in the Transkei, in the then Transkei in the Eastern Cape. Was that in the township or in the village? No, no, in the village. In the village. In the village. Okay. We, our general dealership, uh, we sold to the peasant farmers mm -hmm. their groceries and so on. They also used our shop our box number or private bag as it was called those days for their own correspondence or oh, to receive their mail to receive their mail and Money. and many of them were not literate so we used to as children we used to write their letters for wow. them and read their letters for okay. them uh, in Tosa of course yes. which was uh, the Eastern Cape language so yes my parents were uh, they were communists they joined the Communist Party in the 1930s. Uh, my mother was the first one to join, and she says she said that she recruited my father to the Communist Party. <laughs> How did she do that? <laughs> and, and my father disputed, <laughs> disputed this, but anyway. Uh, so yes, they were. They're both later, eh? Yes, yeah, they're both okay. later. But they your were, mother lived quite long. Yes, my mother died when she was 98, about three years mm -hmm. ago. So they, they were both intellectuals, and the Eastern Cape uh, was actually the hub of the education system for Africans, not yes. just in South Africa, but in Southern Africa and in East Africa. Do you attribute this to um, the arrival of, um, of the missionaries or colonialists? Well, even the Cape? The Cape well, I, I attribute it to our resistance to colonialism. Okay. Uh, the Eastern Cape was the heart of the resistance. We had nearly a hundred year war wow. of the Africans against the colonialists. Just confined to the Eastern Cape? Yeah, fighting against colonization. It started in the middle of the 18th century and it didn't finish until the middle of the night, until towards the end of the 19th century. Any, any names that come out of that? that well, they're, they're, some very famous, names. they're very famous uh, leaders. Mm. On the African side, Hinsa was one of our most famous leaders who fought against the British. Was he a chief? The British Army, yes, he what was one chief of our Hinsa. chief. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Nika was, was, was another one. But our, I think one of our main guerrilla leaders against the British Army for a long time was a guy called Makroma. He was the leader of the Tosa armies who fought against the British and he commanded the Tosa armies against. He's one of our main, uh, but we have others, the famous left-handed person like me called, uh, <laughs> called Makanda. Or Makanda, or, yeah, not Makamba. Makana, not Makamba. Because no, I've since but, discovered there are some Makambas in the Eastern Cape. Oh, are they? Yeah, yeah. They, you see Makana, the, the, the British called him Makana, but his actual name was Makanda. 
and his uh, nickname was Nile, meaning the left, left-handed. Okay. Person. okay. He's okay. a person who mobilizes the attack. When are they oh. getting the arms from them? What? Well, to fight know, against the, the British. The Africans had their indigenous arms, of course, okay. which were bows and arrows. No, right? <laughs> there were spears. There were spears. Yes. Uh, but because the war lasted for so, for a century. The Africans started to use uh, horses and they started to use muskets and guns because they could see the advantage that the white men had. Mm. So, yes, by... Probably bought guns from the Portuguese then. No, they not from trading. the Portuguese. They, they bought, for example, with the opening of the diamond mines, yeah. to get Africans to work in the diamond mines, the, the companies that sold guns to the Africans both in the, in the Cape and in Lesotho. So they acquired guns too. But you know, when you have an unstable society, mm. there's always an opportunity yes. to make money out of yes. Yes. selling yes. guns to both sides as it happens. Yes. So okay. yes. So your, your, your father, um, um, the likes of Oliver Tambo, uh, Nelson Mandela, would be the second generation in the struggle for independence from the Eastern Cape? Uh, no, we have two separate struggles. Mm. You have the struggles of the tribes against losing their land to the whites. That was the your Hinsas, your Nikas, your Makanas, mm -hmm. and so on. That was the first struggle. But the, then you had an emergence of a westernized elite, which led the second struggle. After the first struggle was defeated, then we had a new elite which spoke English, which was educated by the missionaries. Remember our original chiefs didn't go to missionary yeah, education. Yes. So we had a new leadership which then led parties like, which led to the foundation of parties like the ANC. And so that leadership was the second generation of leaders which was now fighting for equality between the races in South Africa. And remember, in the cave, there was a constitution which was developed, uh, which came into effect in 1854. Written by? By the British. Uh -huh. And that constitution, anybody could vote if you had fixed property mm. of valued at 25 pounds and you could write your name 25 pounds only yes just 25 pounds mm -hmm. only and you could write your name so it didn't matter what color you were yes. so we, we so from the 1850s in the eastern cape we had electoral politics wow and then out of this electoral politics the african middle class started setting up newspapers to mobilize the voters yes so the, one of the earliest newspapers set up in the Eastern Cape was called Invo Zabansundu, The Voice of Black People, which was published by a family called Jabavu. Uh, this paper became a very famous newspaper. I think it was set up in 1883. And then you had another one in Natal amongst the Zulu-speaking people. Mm -hmm which was called Ilanga Basen Natal. This newspaper is still running In the side of uh, Natal. Yeah, which was set up by Jabavu, not by Jabavu, by Dube. Which Dube? Uh, John, Dube, John who, Dube, who was the first president of, of the ANC. Hmm. He set up a newspaper, and he also set up a technical school called Oshange. These institutions still, uh, yeah, yeah. they've survived? Some of them say, Ilanga survives. I think it's owned by Inkata Freedom Party today. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we love um, Inkosi Mamasuto Butelezi was a member of the ANC. Yes, yes. 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 So, yes. Yeah. so it, you know, it would make sense. Which makes your father, um, the Tambos and the Mandelas, the third generation yes, in the they, struggle for independence? Yes, they, they are. So you have the first generation, yes. which resisted the white settlers yes. taking the land. And then you have the next generation, which were the founders uh, of the African 
nationalism, if you wish. Yes. Your Jababus. Yes. At the end of the 19th century, the independent black churches, for example, yes. were founded. By, and then their children, who then went to Fort Hare University, which the second generation established. Fort Hare was started in uh, 1908, and the... Who founded it? Uh, was it the blacks or the whites? No, it was the blacks. Okay. Uh, Fort Hare was founded by a gentleman called Walter Hubusan. Mm -hmm. And Walter Hubusan was also one of the founders of the ANC. I think he was the first... Uh, no, he wasn't general. Anyway, he was one of mm -hmm. the, the, the first leaders of the ANC in 1912. Also from the Eastern Cape. Also from the Eastern <coughs> Cape. But he was a member of parliament of the of Cape the Eastern Parliament. Cape. Of the Cape Parliament. Yes. So he, he was the person who started the initiative in 1908 to set up Forte. Uh, he collected money from the African people to build mm. uh, Forte. Uh, and eventually it was opened in 1960. So it was founded by... Because a lot of uh, <coughs> uh, African leaders were educated at Forte. Of course, in Robert Mugabe was one of the yes, yes. students. The former uh, president many, of Zimbabwe. And, yes, and many other leaders from other... Uh, Charles Njonjo mm. from Kenya. He, he was educated at 40. You know. what, what happened to Jabav? I'm just thinking. In, um, in Arare, there's a street called Jabavu Drive. Oh, is there? A huge uh, street mm -hmm. in Haifu in Township. So I'm wondering whether part of the Jabavu family went up with the pioneers. Remember when the pioneers went yeah, up? Yeah. You know, they no, too. I don't think they went. No. You see, the, the, because Jabavu was so important in the emergence of the media. Yes. That's probably where the Harare connection ah, was. Okay. Because they, they were publishing a Tosa language newspaper. Mm -hmm. So that would have gone to Zimbabwe for the Ndabele speakers. Yes. Because yes. It would have been easily. And in the locality where the street is, is um, well, he's late now, but he was a distinguished you know, journalist called uh, Mbofana. Okay. Uh, the forefathers came from here, I'm oh, told from. Yes, I think I. The name sounds familiar. Yes, yes, yes. Fantastic. But your career spanned from journalism to business as well as your current board membership. Have you ever considered uh, considered um, an elective office? No, I, I I don't consider myself to be a politician. I consider myself to be an activist. Uh, which all of us of my generation, your generation, mm. we had to be active in yes. the struggle against colonialism, against apartheid and so on. So I was one of the foot soldiers in, in the ANC. But I, I wasn't interested in a political career. I was more interested. Actually, initially, my initial training was in construction. In construction? Building. Yes. No. Oh, yes. Like where? <laughs> Uh, I uh, studied building and uh, management of building projects at Trent Polytechnic in the United Kingdom. Amazing. And, uh, and worked in construction in the UK and in Tanzania. I also worked in Tanzania in construction. But I then gave that up. For uh, journalism? For journalism. So did you formally train as a, as a journalist? Well, those days, you you trade there, on the there, job. there were no general like the Americans had yes. journalism degree. You, Degrees. You train on the job. Yes. I, I worked for the BBC African Service, um, so that was on the job. Mm. In London? In London, yes. Amazing. The, how would you describe your role as Deputy Chairman of the South African uh, Institute of International Affairs? Well, the Institute of International Affairs is one of the leading think tanks in Africa, not just in South Africa. Um, think tanks are very important in the modern world because they help policymakers yes. to, to, to see the broader socio-economic environment in which their policies, uh, with how their policies impact on the broader environment. Now the Institute of International Affairs focuses on diplomacy and so, not just South Africa, but 
Africa's re inter international relations. So that's what we, we do. We do research. For example, we're having uh, two Zimbabweans coming to explain the changes that have taken place. That have taken place in Zimbabwe. Mm. So we put together an influential South Africans who are interested in Zimbabwe, like businesses, mm. uh, politicians, politicians, the foreign ministry, the churches, I'm the sure. Churches. So they will come and listen to these two Zimbabwean experts on what is going on in Zimbabwe, what are these changes, what are they likely to lead to. So we, we organize those kinds of forums. And of course, being a South African think tank, we have a huge number of South African companies that operate throughout Africa. So they are always uh, willing to learn about the politics, the society, the economic environment, the business opportunities in the African countries. Do so, they fund you as well? Yes, yes, they okay. pay for it. So yeah. what are you? Are you are you are you rightist? Are you leftist? I mean, like in America you'll know that the Brooklyn's institution is funded by People, you know, with a leaning either to the Republicans or to the Democrats, uh, the same, you know, goes for the newspapers, the Washington Post or the New York Times. Um, and most of these institutions are led by former, you know, senators or secretaries of state and so on. So, which, what is your leaning? Well, well, the institute was started more than eight years ago, in the 1930s, I think, 1934 by Ernest Oppenheimer, mm, the miner, the miner yes. who started Anglo-American Corporation. So he felt that South Africa was too inward looking, it had to learn a bit more yes. about the big white outside. world, yes. about the outside world. So we are really a public education institution to educate the public, especially the youth, about the, the going zone of the world. Of the world, but especially of Africa, because obviously as a South African Institute, Africa is central to our research. So we do research, educate, public education. For example, we have schools, competitions among schools on international relations. But embassies in South Africa commission us if they, they want to understand uh, a particular development, not just in South Africa, but in Africa, mm. then they will commission us to do research on that and issue a report for them. So yes, it's, it's, it's not like the American uh, think tanks which are aligned with this party or, or that, the other party. Yes. Ours is, is fairly independent, but we are we play an advisory role to our government ministry of foreign affairs. Or what is what we call the DECO. DECO, yes, mm. Department of International Relations. Yeah. It's very interesting that we we um, have this interview at a time when uh, talking of funding. Um, a gentleman who who funded, who gave uh, the the Trump campaign twenty five million dollars, um, and got Donald, you know, Trump to pledge that he would move the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem as part of his election campaign, just succeeded. We also, the American president yeah. making that announcement. What's your view on that? Well, I, I, I think my view is the same as the view of all the Africans, mm. which, which is that the two-state resolution, which incidentally African countries are part of, yes. uh, should be implemented and that the issue of Jerusalem should be agreed between the Palestinians, the Palestinians and, and the Israelis. Yes. Uh, so South Africa has an embassy in Tel Aviv, mm. and it's definitely not in many other countries. Have. So, well, you know, Donald Trump is a white card. He mm. has been denounced even by his allies in mm. Western Europe and so on for this particular action. He has his own way of doing things. Yeah. 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 So, uh, what do you prefer to be called, Mister or Comrade? <laughs> <laughs> Does well, it depend well, where you are? <laughs> if, if you are with Ali Halime, <laughs> sorry, he's late. <laughs> you prefer to be called Comrade, maybe. <laughs> but Mister Becky, some have called you an Afro pessimist, based on your analysis in your books, such as 
the architects of poverty, um, why African capitalism needs changing, um, but how would you describe yourself? Where do you place yourself? No, I, I definitely wouldn't call myself a, an Afro-pessimist. Uh, I think Africa has a very bright future, but we have a lot of problems that we have to overcome. And many African intellectuals and politicians, when you say problems have to be addressed, they label you as a pessimist. I don't, to say that we, we have to address problems of democracy, problems of poverty, problems of manufacturing industries, development of entrepreneurs, and the leadership, people think, leadership. leadership, they think you are a pessimist. They want you to just sing praises to existing leaders and to existing uh, policies that our government in South Africa is practicing or governments in other countries are practicing. They call you that you are a pessimist if you criticize that. But I, I don't see that. So, so would you call yourself, what are you, a, a realist? Well, you know, I, I, I call myself uh, an an African activist, activist who wants to see change in Africa benefiting the majority of the African people, not just small elites.